Scientists say a new virus related to SARS may be responsible for a mysterious pneumonia outbreak in China. You just heard the first mention of what would become known as COVID-19 on a CBS News broadcast. Since then, nearly 2 million people have died around the world, including 385,000 Americans. The crisis is so bad, it ranks among the top four deadliest events in U.S. history. It is behind World War II, the 1918 influenza outbreak, and the Civil War. World Health Organization researchers are arriving in Wuhan to begin their investigation into the origins of COVID-19. This month marks one year since journalists began reporting on what may be the biggest health crisis of our lives. For more, I want to bring in one of those journalists, Helen Branswell. She is a senior writer covering infectious disease for STAT. So far, she's written 148 articles on the coronavirus. Helen, welcome. Boy, how far we have come in a year. When you first started reporting on this SARS-like virus a year ago, did you have any inkling of what was to come? Were there any red flags for you? So I first heard about it on New Year's Eve 2019. I saw something on a listserv that I subscribed to that pushes out news about infectious disease outbreaks. And it was looking effectively for information on um, unexplained pneumonias in China. I'd covered the 2003 SARS outbreak. I was based in Toronto then, and Toronto was very badly hit. So when I saw unexplained pneumonias in China, yeah, I knew that something that really needed to be watched carefully was happening, but I didn't know it was going to be this bad, I have to confess. And of course, there's always the potential of more of those unexplained SARS-like viruses popping up. Do you keep a close eye on any new reports of things like that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> but and, and people certainly mm -hmm. keep a close eye on coronaviruses since the 2003 outbreak. You know, there's been another one. Uh, there's a virus that's called MERS that um, occasionally infects people in the Middle East. It's a coronavirus that jumps from camels to people. Coronaviruses has proved to be really effective at jumping from animal species into humans and starting to spread within humans. So they are, a, a, you know, a, a, a pathogen that people or pathogen family that people really watch closely. And what do you make of these new, more transmissible strains that are popping up in the UK and South Africa, some that have uh, you know, been discovered here as well? Are you keeping a close eye on those? Do those worry you particularly? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, so far the um, indications are that they don't cause more severe disease. But if you just think about sheer numbers, if more people, if, if these new variants are more transmissible, and in some cases the indications are that they might be like 40 or 50 percent more transmissible, you could get a lot more people infected in a pretty short period of time. The country's health system is, is overwhelmed now. Getting, you know, a lot more cases is really going to be uh, stretching things to the limits and perhaps beyond. So, and so when you look back at your reporting um, on this over the past year, and boy, I mean, we've all reported on it as well. It's it's covered. It's been at the top of most of our, you know, newscasts for, for much of 2020. Um, is there a particular moment when you look back that really stands out to you uh, as a big? groundswell change, or are there moments in general that, that you reflect on? Yeah, you know, in uh, about February 11th, I think it was, I was um, moderating a panel in D.C. Um, on the, the emerging virus. Dr. Fauci was on it, Nancy Massonier from the CDC was on it, and, um, you know, I was asking people like them why we weren't taking this more seriously. The, this, the thinking seemed to be that it was causing a problem in China, but that there was no indication that the virus was going to spread uh, in the same way outside of China as it would inside of China. And I could not understand that. I thought, this is a virus. It's not going to behave differently anywhere that it goes. Um, and I started asking people about it after that panel. And, um, you know, I was about to write a story and 
the outbreak exploded in first Iran and then in Italy. And we started to see that the virus did spread very well outside of China. And um, we're dealing with the aftermath of that still. And as a journalist who's covered this so closely, are you now confident in the country's ability to handle a pandemic? Do you feel the country has learned those lessons to not, uh, you know, to not react as we did in February, but to take it more seriously first time around? No, I'm actually sort of disappointed and, and discouraged a bit at the response so far. Uh, you know, I'd never, I'd, I'd worked for years on what a bad pandemic might look like and, and you know, steps that could be taken. I never, you know, paused to think about what would happen when you injected politics into pandemic response. I didn't realize that, you know, a part of a country might decide not to wear masks because the political leader that they followed uh, didn't wear a mask. That, that didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to me that a political leader of a country would play down a deadly pandemic because it wasn't convenient for his election, election chances. Uh, you know, the country has, has suffered badly because of the way the outbreak has, has been handled. And it, you know, there's a lot more um, pain to come. I mean, in the last 14 days, 40,000 people in this country have died. And, you know, the rest of the winter is going to be tough. We still face very tough times. You make a very good point. I think a lot of us were surprised at how uh, politics infused itself in this battle against a pandemic. All right. Well, Holland, uh, Helen Branswell, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.